Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm the moderator on this panel. My name is Florin Opria, the second one, Opria, in fact. Uh, I run my own, my own consulting firm. <clears throat> it's based in uh, the EU, in Romania. Uh, and I publish my own uh, daily financial newsletter focusing uh, fintech, blockchain, and the crypto world. Uh, I have a background in financial markets. I used to work in an exchange, in a derivatives exchange in Romania, and also run various consulting projects. Uh, and used to be an editor of a, of a daily newsletter focusing exchanges. Having said that, it means that I'm watching this uh, exchange space from quite uh, some time. And uh, uh, because of that, uh, I used to watch the emergence of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. So we have talked, uh, we have discussed on the previous panel on the emergence of crypto assets and the whole process of ICOs and so on and so forth. And of course, um, this market, uh, the ICO market. But what happened next? Do you trade? Who owns a crypto asset? Who trades? I think a lot of people, but uh, this is after lunch, so maybe they are sleeping, but they, they are sleeping uh, with their portfolio because they are <laughs> lurching there. Okay. Uh, what happens? There, there, there are a lot of cryptocurrency exchanges out there, but I'm sure that you have heard of uh, at least some of them. Uh, they are all pre we have the representatives here in, uh, in the room. And uh, we will talk uh, with them about the future of crypto trading and uh, the current status of this um, trading environment and uh, what, we, what will we do and what's next. So, uh, let's uh, welcome our uh, speakers. Uh, <coughs> it's, uh, they are coming from um, Western markets, um, but I'm sure they are aware of everything that, uh, that happens in, uh, everywhere in the world. Um, it's um, our first speaker, it's Claire Wells. <coughs> She's a director in legal and business affairs and, um, at, at Circle. She has been working at, Cir uh, at Circle sorry, for almost two years and has a very strong background as a legal counsel in the financial sector. Our second uh, <coughs> speaker is uh, uh, Miss uh, Kristen Stone. Let's welcome her. She's the product manager at Coinbase. <coughs> I'm sure you have used Coinbase if you own Bitcoin, so maybe you have started with uh, uh, using their services. Uh, she has been working there for about four years, so she, if you have some very good questions, you should attack her at the end. Uh, she has done a lot of things there, including strategic partnerships. And our um, last but not least speaker, <laughs> uh, Mr. Sergei Ipliev from Likia. Uh, Lika, for those that you don't know, is a semi-decentralized exchange based in, in uh, the Switzerland, but it has a global um, strategy, let's say. Okay, uh, what, what do we want to find out? It's uh, what's the current status of things in the, in, in the markets right now, and uh, what are their vision uh, as financial professionals and also as representative of major uh, exchanges uh, in the world. Some, some few words for, for the start to, to talk about yourselves first and then go through various questions if you want to start to sure. break the ice. Um, well, thank you for having me. Uh, out, out of interest, how many people have heard of Circle? Would it be helpful for me to give a brief intro? Okay, great, so a few. Uh, so Circle was started in 2013 by uh, Sean Neville and Jeremy Lair with a view to change how people create and share value. So with that, uh, they bought their first product uh, to market, Circle Pay, which is a fiat P2P app that enables you to send uh, money in, uh, seamless and, uh, seamlessly and free instantly in euros, uh, sterling and dollar. From there, they developed Circle Invest, which is uh, a means of buying and selling crypto assets. Uh, we recently acquired Poloniex, which is a cryptocurrency exchange, one of the largest and most well-known in the world. Uh, Circle Trade, which is an OTC desk, um, trading about two, over two billion a month uh, in liquidity. And uh, we are going to be announcing the launch of USDC, which is a fiat-backed stablecoin coming to market soon. Um, we have offices in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. Um, and headcounts currently at around 300. 
we've raised 250 million to date from traditional VC backers uh, like Jim Breyer who invested in Facebook and uh, a number of other uh, institutions such as Goldman's. Thank you. Coinbase. <laughs> Kristen actually is the name. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh -huh. So I'm Kristen Stone. I currently work at Coinbase as a product manager uh, and I've been there for four years and I think that's really interesting in this space. We've changed a lot, we've grown a lot, uh, lots of companies have come and gone. And the most interesting thing as I introduce Coinbase that you probably wouldn't know if you're just buying Bitcoin um, or Ethereum is that our goal is to build an open financial system for the world. So Brian Armstrong started this company and he really looked at the technology and asked what it, what it could do. Uh, and the belief that we could give financial opportunity to every individual in the world. Uh, obviously there's a long way to go and so much of that starts with trading. But I think it's really applicable at this conference with this group, uh, which is how do we continue to expand beyond trading? This panel here is talking about trading today and trading in the future. Uh, and Coinbase itself, with its mission, is looking to what's next and what comes after that and how do we together as an industry build an open financial system. So yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Actually, I uh, just realized we share the same vision. <laughs> so I'm, I've, I've, Sergey, I'm Sergey, the co-founder of Liki, and we did, I mean, we started this vision and kind of this movement in 2015. And uh, I mean, the goal is uh, the bigger goal is to democratize finance and like create a global marketplace where anyone in the world can like freely you know trade and engage into the con contracts and you know exchange digital assets and uh, you know make it really low f like, low barrier entry and sort of all of the world. And with Bitcoin, probably I mean, this crypto is first time we can do it like really you know to bypass the banking system and all the existing you know uh, uh, legacy that that's that's kind of make it possible. And then we also started um, uh, to experiment with, uh, with technologies, and uh, I'll tell more a bit like how we saw the like the exchange design to make it uh, you know safer and uh, to make it decentralized and empower the people that own the the, the assets actually they to, to exchange it. And uh, so we also did our ICO, and we probably pioneered the secure, like tokenized security. We made the equity tokenized uh, from a Swiss company into the blockchain and issued the color coin. For and in, to the date we raised like uh, around um, probably six million like put by this ISO finance. So yeah, I mean now it's uh, it's a wallet and uh, it's an exchange, and also seek is much bigger part of the future ecosystem. Still on? Okay. Um, these are all successful, were successful startups. Now they are uh, going into global um, into global operations. The, they, they have grown, all these three companies have grown uh, in the last years um, very aggressively um, and now they are attacking uh, the big uh, money, let's say, so the big financial markets. Uh, but at the same time, because it, it was a very successful model until now, and it will be, uh, it caught the attention of major global players. Uh, like um, uh, Intercontinental Exchange, it has a major product with a major um, uh, project with uh, Starbucks. Um, we have Nasdaq, who, which recently bought Sinover, which is a, which was a major European um, uh, vendor and uh, um, offers a lot of uh, a lot of products. So it means it uh, Nasdaq will go more into blockchain and, and crypto, and multiple projects from Goldman Sachs. Uh, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and so on and so forth. So, from this point of view, how do you see the markets in the future? Because they will be your competitors, because you are now entering their territories. Claire, please. In my mind, I, I think, you know, traditional financial systems uh, can, they, they offer one type of service. I think Blockchain and the revolution that accompanies it offers the ability to, to pave the way for the tokenization of everything. So anything that you have of value can be tokenized on a liquid market, on a global basis, uh, and that's enormous. Uh, I think that's far larger than the traditional financial system. So in answer to your question, I think, yes, 
traditional market players are going to innovate in this space. They're going to want to take advantage of um, you know, these valuable assets that are currently being traded. Uh, but in terms of real innovation, I think what we're going to see uh, is something that we that isn't in, in market yet. So we're going to see an uh, innovation in terms of products offered, the types of assets that are tokenized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Kristen, please. Yeah, I like I like this question a lot. Um, it's really interesting as you marry the world of finance and the world of tech, uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with Claire, there's so many more products that will come out of this revolution than just what we see in the financial world. I'm excited for these companies to come in, to join, to help create what the next step is. As I view trading, um, you actually need a lot of traders in to help reduce the volatility, to uh, bring what we already know in this industry, the services and regular trading, bringing cryptocurrency there, but that's not where it stops. There's so much more that this industry can and will be. And I think it's pretty challenging for the incumbents um, to take a bet on everything that is available. Uh, so it's hard for them to show up and to start building a decentralized exchange. They have regulation that they have to follow. They have customers that they have to serve. And so really in this space, it's the new, it's the startup, it's the people probably who are in this room today that will create uh, the next wave. And it helps and it'll accelerate that by having large players come and join in as they know, but I don't think they can really take this to the next level. And why do you think Coinbase will, will be able to do it? Because, mm -hmm. why am I asking? Because I know Coinbase, uh, which has a very aggressive uh, developer strategy, at least, at least lately in the last year, um, it has a, um, it has bought some uh, companies, and it, ha it has now license for banks as as uh, for a bank or a bank charter, uh, and as a broker. So, you want to penetrate that sector, but you need to go the traditional way. Yeah, that that's. A very good question and, and something we struggled with a lot in the early days was um, how do we become and live in this decentralized world and help advocate for this technology we believe in but at the same time we do have to play by the regulation that exists today um, and one of our one of our core statements is that we try to make crypto easy to use and that means having um, certain licenses, that means ensuring customer safety at that level, and really trying to be on the forefront of educating different groups. Um, yeah, and so I, I don't know exactly, I don't think we'll be the, the fast startup, that's who we used to be, um, but we're in a different different area now at our company and stage and lifestyle, and so we're, we're helping to bring this technology to as many customers as possible through many of our products, but we also recognize that as uh, one of the largest companies in the United States in crypto, we have to focus on regulation and help to bring this technology to customers in a safe and secure way. Okay. How about Lique and the and Switzerland and e, the EU space? Uh, are you sure this? I mean, the question was about like how and we why, and like, why I'm asking yeah, that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the perfect occasion because I know Borsa Stuttgart, so the stock exchange in Stuttgart has already announced some plans in, in going to crypto, and also uh, Deutsche Börse. <coughs> it's pretty much the announcement every month. Some, some big guy, actually, some, big, some big firm going to crypto. And it's been for last years, actually, so it's not kind of something new. For incumbents, it's really hard to go and really full scale there to adopt the, the new you know, risks, probably, coming with technology. And so they all be, always be kind of very much you know, conservative and like, you know, in, in going further. So this is the, the probably the advantage of the new companies that, that they, they have. Like if you look at the, for example, uh, you know, uh, European exchange space is probably, uh, there are some announcements like Swiss exchange, six, they have announced it's gonna be a digital exchange, but, uh, but it's, uh, it will take a long, long time before they actually accept the crypto buy like as an asset. So they probably will go into the stock and the security space, but to really, I mean the big, Probably the biggest innovation is in crypto itself, in, in Bitcoin and you know Bitcoin-like you know uh, open chains, which allow the value to be secured you know and transferred. 
with all these parties. And for this, actually, uh, actually, probably we have like these young exchanges that have like two, three years in kind of advantage. Okay, I think the next question will link to what we have discussed. But why are you, why are you so successful? Like, like uh, Mustafa asked ICO Box uh, earlier. So wh why are people coming to you? Claire, why are people using Circle? Why are people trading on Polonix? I'm also a trader on Polonix. <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> um, Before being bought by Circle. <laughs> very good. Uh, I think, you know, there are a number of reasons why people come to Circle. One is because we are very product and consumer led, so we want to make sure that we get a really good product market fit, that it's, um, that it's consumer driven and uh, that it makes buying and selling these assets as easy as possible. Um, the other is that, you know, we work closely with uh, a whole swathe of regulatory bodies uh, and industry bodies to help move the dial on where legislation is going um, for this space. Because I think some of the key blockers for mainstream adoption are things like uh, the fact that we don't have uh, scalable blockchain yet. We, we need to... Um, get a global harmonized approach in terms of uh, regulation because it's a global phenomenon and yet people are still treating it on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. Um, uh, I think fiat, fiat backed stable coins are going to be really key as well. So I, I say that because we're working on all of those initiatives to try um, and move the industry forward. So I think that's why Circle has been so successful today and will continue to be at the forefront of uh, innovation in this space. Okay. Why is Convey so successful? Uh, yeah, I think we're very similar to Circle in this way. Our two key uh, phrases is to be the most trusted and the easiest to use. So in, right. in those sense, we just want to have a customer base that knows they can trust us, which is fairly unique in crypto in the early days it was, and to be the easiest to use so you can come on technology that's rather confusing can become uh, very obvious. And I think that makes us successful as a company, but tr truthfully, what makes any company successful is being at the right time at the right place. And crypto itself um, was very successful over the last couple of years. And so I think a lot of the success of, of this industry has just been the adoption from the people, the adoption from the world, and the growth of the technology, um, and the entrance of all of the companies who are making it easy to use. Okay. What about Europe? Uh, actually, and the world. Yeah. So I mean, uh, the, the the last mile is very important. Like if we, when you bring technology to the to real people, and like you need to empower them, but then still, I mean, they have troubles uh, to you know to say what is a private key, how to manage it, and you need to kind of to educate them. And this was kind of a long time. In how to, uh, you can you need to think about um, this safety, but you know, in an easy way. So that. Uh, so we spend like a lot of time in UI, like like designing the UI in the mobile, so in a way that it will be so like, convenient to you know, um, you know do the backups and you know uh, exchange the crypto, but not thinking about the crypto itself. I mean, just play it like an internet, you know, mobile application. And so, um, uh, but at the same time, uh, you mentioned the scalability thing. It's it's a kind of a big um, barrier to, to for crypto to succeed. Currently, I mean, most of the crypto is used as a kind of a, a store of value, kind of uh, trading facility for the. Now, if you look at the real usage, is probably the Bitcoin and some, you know, some, some Ethereum, like Ethereum and Ethereum projects. But the, the the scalability poses the barrier. But looking at the space, like how many manpower is now used to, to solve this problem, is probably the biggest activity now, like uh, since the internet, right? So it's uh, the number of teams and the, their potential may and hit more. I have no doubt this problem will be solved like, like in a couple of years for sure, and we'll see kind of the ways to, to scale, you know, uh, with micro sharding, with you know level two, with Lightning Network type of you know things, and and, and this time actually uh, the real game will start, the, the real adoption of the vote. Okay, all all three uh, startups who are now global players started with retail customers, uh, but now. Are, since they grew and uh, there is a lot of new potential for them, uh, they are now targeting a different types of uh, fish, let's say. 
So they are going after the big money, like I said earlier. So my question, my one, my question is, what's the what's the uh, rate between in the business between uh, retail customers and institutional customers? So revenues coming from them, from these two types of customers, and what are the plans for getting more into institutional trading? Uh, why I'm asking is because I think uh, the, the Asian markets or Asian uh, exchanges are having uh, are taking the the most of the uh, retail trading volumes. So this is why I think Western markets are focusing more on um, institutional trading because it's more money with less trouble. So please. In so I wouldn't say that we're just targeting institutional traders. Uh, we have a wide uh, demographic of, of users, both on the retail high net worth and on the institutional side. Um, and our product offering reflects that. So you know, you want to build a product for your customer, and so we've actually segregated out how we uh, how we provide that offering. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we want to, uh, whether it's five or ten years down the line, we want to uh, facilitate the tokenization of everything, um, which is a means of democratizing how value is exchanged. Uh, and so that necessarily implies that you have uh, retail customers who support that cause and who, who want that to be facilitated. So that's definitely, definitely a focus for us. At the same time, we want to work with our bank, traditional banking partners, with the traditional incumbents in the, in the financial sector, because I do think there's scope for uh, very interesting partnerships and innovation in the space um, by leveraging sort of t the two sets of knowledge. Um, so yeah, I, I'd, I, I'm, I'm hedging my bets there by saying we're, co we're, we're covering all bases and we'll continue to do so. Okay. I like this. I like what you said here, Florin, which is uh, you can target institutions and make more money with less trouble. Is yeah. that, you should tweet that. That's a good one. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a good question. And similar to Circle, we have a lot of different products uh, that we offer to our customers. But personally, I've, I've seen this interesting sort of flow in the space that's happened. So earlier on, it was only people in the like niche world, someone who was a crypto anarchist living in the middle of nowhere. And that's the people who wanted to buy Bitcoin. And so I, at that time, I think it was far more retail focused. Um, and then I think also there's a difference culturally speaking in, in lots of markets. And then as uh, this technology proved its value, we saw a lot more entrance for institutions. So now suddenly they wanted to pay attention. Businesses started to get on board. And it's true, you know, they'll provide a lot more revenue and likely value. They'll be more clear. You have fewer customers, so you have fewer requests to take in. I have some statistics here. Oh, great. Which prove that. So last year, we have 96 new crypto funds wow. globally. Since last year, Bitcoin is down 60% or something like that. We have now 156 new crypto funds until date. So the business is growing for institutional trading. I like this. I don't even have to bring my own statistics. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's Bloomberg. So oh. <laughs> Bloomberg you should, you should read. You should read my newsletter. It's DigiCat News. You can <laughs> go and start the app. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. It's, yeah. I think the other the other point is that we're all talking about institutions and business, like hedge funds and all the things that are growing, because it's an obvious use case. Speculation is very clear. It's it's obvious. So of course businesses and institutions is what we talk about. Uh, I think the technology that's right on the edge that hasn't yet been proven, this consumer application, um, which is really what we're all here for, that how will this make people's lives better, just hasn't come around yet. So my, my guess is that in a couple of years, as we sort of understand how institutions can, that market becomes saturated, we'll be able to move into the consumer side again. Mm -hmm. So we sort of started with this niche, we moved into institutions, and then in time we'll be back in customers. So hopefully we're here again two years, your newsletter is famous, world famous. And, and uh, everybody's happy. Uh, everyone here started to read it, and we yeah. just talk about consumers again. Okay.
actually, consumers? Or? Actually, I wanted to be provocative here. I mean, um, we shouldn't work with institutions. I mean, for us, we made a decision like strategically don't work with, you know, don't, you know, serve the, you know, financial institutions or like any other. We, we can help like merchants to adopt because they adopt crypto. But in a sense, um, if you look at the world, like there's a high concentration of value. I mean, they already served. I mean, they, they, they don't need another system. They can actually, they, they try to diversify and take part of this new, like, digital economy. But in a sense, the, the one that they need is those who are the least served. And they live outside probably Europe and US and they live, you know, all over the world. And like we started to serve like all of the countries with just, you know, a couple of exceptions like North Korea, but really try to embrace the, all of the clients from all of the customers, also all, all, of the, all the countries, but it, it's, it's difficult, right? Because there are different standards of, you know, uh, for example, proof address. When you do KYC on a proof address, you know, in, in many countries, they simply don't have a street names. Right? It, they cannot provide any proof address. And by default requirements for anti-money laundering, you have to have a kind of proof address. So this becomes a kind of a challenge with the compliance, how we still can serve those, you know, uh, people, but you know, like without kind of really, um, you know, help allowing you know, bad things to happen. So this is a challenge, this is difficult, but this is, I think, the only way to go. Identity on the blockchain. There we go. <laughs> okay, uh, we are getting close, so we need to wrap up. Uh, in f very, very few words, very, very few words, what do you think It's the current status of global crypto markets? The current. The current. Current very state. Very few words. <laughs> current 30 state. seconds. 30 seconds. I'll, I'll Keep it even shorter. Our current state is. You got um, 20. <laughs> in a, <laughs> we're in a bear market. It's down at the moment. Um, I think everybody's waiting for regulatory certainty as to how this asset, that this asset class, is going to be treated, or how the three different asset classes are going to be treated, i.e., utility, payment, and security tokens. Um, following which, I think, you know, we 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 may see some some uplift. I think the current market is incredible. <laughs> no buts, no, there's nothing. Okay. How to organize is the building time. So, I mean, it's, it's now, it's, the hype is over in a sense. It's, uh, there's not, like, there's less noise. There is more signal. And given that so many teams are working on solving the core problems, like of the, like, scalability and the, you know, volatility stabilization of the, of the, of the crypto, is, there will be solutions and there will be kind of a new spring to, Okay, so if you're a survivor in the market right now, you should pay attention to one regulation to keep in mind that it's incredible. And <laughs> what? <laughs> what was yours? And to uh, build, to build things, to build now. things. So to keep the hope. And uh, in order to to keep it up, uh, you need to follow the next panel, which is about regulation. And until then, we will take some questions. We you have four minutes and a half. Yes. Um, my question was, this is coming from a skeptic. I'm an academic, so it comes with the territory. But <laughs> um, you made your companies out of trading cryptocurrencies, and you clearly mentioned that uh, in future you expect tokenization and transfer of value. But I'm a little skeptic about what value that was being transferred for the past few years. I mean, it looks to me like it was, there was a transfer of wealth And, and it looks like an unjust enrichment a little bit. <laughs> uh, but um, for your businesses, I mean, you, you could be indifferent to what is being traded on the exchanges, but for the sustainability, um, do you think this crypto market is going to actually create a value and that what you're enabling in trading is actually creating value so that, you know, in the end, social welfare and economy is going to benefit from it, so... Yeah, I think that's a great question. If Sorry, I, yeah? can, I answer with a, can I answer with a question? Define value. Define um, value. For example, in... You Where know, do you find value? A regular exchange of a stock exchange, for example, it actually enables people to, you know, diversify their investments and because they are being part of a value creation, which is like a company producing something or a service. And um, in cryptocurrency case, I don't see it being like the same thing, like, like or I don't know, the value, 
I have my own definition. So okay, value, go ahead. value <laughs> is, <laughs> is as relative as happiness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is my own definition. In, in that case, you could as well be working for a big uh, casino in Las Vegas, or is, is that is that is that value that Maybe. you're creating? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, well, okay then. No, I mean it's <laughs> okay. Let's see. Let's so, see the answers. just to answer your your uh, question there, I I. At Circle, we do care what's listed on the exchange, and very much so. We want to develop Poloniex to be a multi-sided marketplace where any individual can come and create a liquid market in an asset that was previously illiquid uh, by in tokenized form. So imagine a world where I could uh, tokenize part of my house, trade it on a global network, um, with a counterparty over in Japan, and I, that, how is that not creating value? It's it's an amazing network effect. I put it speaking, yes, but that's not the current situation, is it? Right, but we've, as I said, we've got a, a five to ten years. <laughs> this is just the start of the revolution. Should personally, I see the biggest potential in not kind of transferring the existing value from the old system, but creating a new like digital value. I mean, there's all these kind of digital assets which are possible to tokenize, like IP rights, like you know, music rights, like you know, digital physical, like you know, the digital fashion, like you know, like you can tokenize the, the art and put it like an ERC twenty or ERC seven to one non non fungible token, and this would be like just a new market of new digital assets, and this will create a new value and exchangeable on the blockchain only. I want to answer that question. So, um, Bitcoin was in 2013, I think, it was $500. Now it's 6,000. So it, it has value, even if it was 19,000. It has, it still has value. Okay. So for those people who are keeping it, it has value. Next question and the last one. And we'll, will we get her a microphone? I really, I love the skeptics. They're great. I mean, it makes for good conversation. It's how things, it's how things You cannot grow. exist without them. Exactly. Thank you. Great question. Uh, my question is, uh, I know that Circle and Coinbase, uh, the both companies' uh, main headquarters is based on Europe. Uh, but when we look at the data, um, trading Bitcoin and trading other blockchain cryptocurrencies uh, very low in Europe. Uh, even we compare with Turkey and some emerging economies, Asia and United States. Why? Uh, I mean, many uh, European countries, uh, even in G8, uh, but their trading uh, blockchain is very low. This is kind of controversial, or they have a technology bias? What? <laughs> yeah, um, and if I understood your question correctly, it's, um, you know, we both have offices in Europe, and so as we see trading volume low comparatively to other places, so why not expand our business there? Yeah, kind of. Kind of, is there anything else in that? Uh, for example, uh, do you uh, have a plan to open an office in Istanbul or some other Asian countries or just you are doing operation in Europe? Um, yeah, so currently we have an office in San Francisco in, in the United States and also in Europe and I believe in Japan as well. So we are expanding out and I think part of the challenge is that Coinbase was a startup a couple of years ago. We're just kind of moving beyond that phase now. Um, but a lot of our investment has to come from revenue that we create or um, venture capital that we take in. And so expanding is just a, a little bit slower. Our app, our app, our Coinbase app is available anywhere in the world. Uh, but the ability to buy and sell is only in a, a handful, I think 20 five countries or so now. Um, and a lot of that is because we choose to work really closely with regulation and with the regulatory bodies before we'll enter the country. Um, so we want to make sure that we have solid banking partners, they understand what uh, Bitcoin blockchain look like, 
and how we're going to operate there and that we follow all the regulations. So I think it's just slower from that point. Um, of course, one day we'd like to operate everywhere in the world, especially in Istanbul, being here today. Um, but I, I, I think that's also just takes a little bit of time for a company in, in our position. Anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, I'd echo a lot of, a lot of what you said. We, we currently do have offices in uh, US, Europe, and in Asia. Um, and I, one thing I would say is actually market statistics are incredibly hard to find in an accurate manner in that it, like, where, do, what do you look at in terms of, uh, what, what do you look at as the sort of key metrics for, for market adoption? You know, is it, is it uh, ownership of BTC? Is it ownership of a wallet? Is it uh, day traders? Is it, do you know what I mean? There are so many different metrics and actually it's still a relatively early, early market that actually it's quite hard to form a really strong international strategy based on what is often anonymous sources and actually as we were discussing earlier, a lot of false, um, false data in, out in the ecosystem. And I'll say this is one, one, one more interesting point on that is that there's this trade-off that happens because as a tech company, as a software company, you should be able to operate anywhere in the world, especially as a blockchain company. Um, but unfortunately, as a finance company, you can't do that without a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and so I think the promise is to build something that's available for everyone, but the actual work to get there is, I mean, it's gonna take 10 years. It's going to take all of us working together. Um, and so, yeah, I hope more people bring that opportunity and can help bring com major companies in, but as well, like, create it here, bring it in from the space, because that's who knows this industry best, is the people who live here. Sure. And I have, yeah. I, sorry, I have something to add. 55% of all financial transactions in the world are cleared in London. So you do the mathematics between why are they there? Okay, 55%. Actually, I want to praise the Turkish community in a sense. Uh, in, in our platform at Liki, actually, we have, like, I think it's number three or number four, like, country by activity by you know, number of clients we're having from. And I've seen the recent number by the Inc. mobile survey. The, the adoption in Turkey is the highest in Europe. It's like 18%, like, on average, they, they own cryptocurrency and 45% they plan to own. It's probably huge. I mean, it's like, it's leaders in the world. And as Christian Lagarde said in the IMF leader, but when you the country reach like 20% of you know level of adoption, the the next step to the 80% will be just in one two years. So we'll probably see the like digitization of you know bit like in, in Turkey like in, in next year. Yeah. And okay. Thank you everybody. I hope this was uh, all very helpful for everybody. And uh, let's uh, get together in five weeks from now and see the status of this uh, <laughs> incredible market. <laughs> <laughs>